come from uh, Mount Shasta and uh, Dunsmuir. Gave two talks, one talk each. And then before that, I gave a talk in Taos and in um, San Fe, New Mexico. So next I go to Bend, Oregon, and then to Sisters, and then I head home to Olympia, Washington. Thank you. I'm actually a historian by trade, and I have a background in uh, undergraduate biology. I am not a plasma physicist, I am not an astrophysicist, but my concern was so great when the publisher asked me if I thought if he thought if I thought that I could write a book on chemtrails, I agreed to do so because the experts are signing confidentiality agreements, they're being threatened, some of them are being removed. And so I decided that this is the time for good research. I spent a year and a half researching, and uh, the result is uh, chemtrails harp and the full spectrum dominance of planet Earth. I call it the meat and potatoes uh, book because it's the go-to answer book on what's going on. And the reason I'm on this book tour is not particularly to get rich uh, selling a book, believe me, I won't get rich, but to uh, fill in the gaps in your understanding of what this program, this geoengineering program, really is. We're being uh, lied to in the press that it's a solar radiation management project, that really laying <coughs> chemtrails will produce cirrus clouds that will then uh, deflect global warming, UVs, and the truth is entirely other. I'm going to redefine global warming for you tonight. I'm going to clarify the difference between a chemtrail and a contrail. I'm going to talk about Morgellons, which is uh, one of the aspects of what's being dropped on us. My background is kind of interesting. I'll just tell you two things. When I was a full adult and my father was dead, I discovered that he had been working for the Office of Navy Intelligence his entire life. I had no idea. He was a, an inorganic chemist, and he worked uh, for Dow Chemical. He worked for Texas A&M. Um, he was uh, involved with intelligence his whole life. And, and here I am, <coughs> researching for years about the underbelly of the United States and why we're losing this country. And it turns out that um, I came from an intelligence family. I had no idea. Second of all, when I read Nick Begich and Gene Manning's book, Angels Don't Play This Heart, in 1996, they had published it the year before. I was uh, taking the book with me to a substitute teaching job at the north end of my town in Olympia, which is near the dual base of Fort Lewis and McCord Air Force Base, and apparently uh, many um, spouses of officers and uh, soldiers were substitute teaching in the area. Never occurred to me. So I sat down in the lunchroom at a table, and two uh, male teachers sat down and asked me what I was reading. Next to me was a, a woman whose face I never saw because she was leaned over so far to her sandwich. And they asked me about the book. Uh, I told them the little bit I knew because I was still reading it. I really had not at all put together that harp and chemtrails went together yet. I was simply interested in harp. And harp stands for, it's an acronym for High Frequency Active Rural Research Project. It uh, was running at that time in Gakona, Alaska, and it's still there, but there is now some public doubt as to its disposition. It has belonged to private corporations like Raytheon. It has been under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Air Force, and of course the research organ of the military, DARPA. So at this point, it's under DARPA. But uh, the, the 115 acres that it is, uh, these microwave heaters are on 
has really been uh, superseded by other installations around the world. One being in the northern hemisphere, uh, the Arecibo uh, Radio Observatory down in Puerto Rico. So uh, I, uh, I shared a little with these guys. We all went our ways. The next day I was out doing some yard work and a military helicopter came over my house and stayed for five minutes. Uh, perhaps to scare my neighborhood, perhaps to scare me, perhaps to just log my XY coordinates. And suddenly the next day my phone was clicking and I, uh, I assumed I had a phone tap. So I had no idea at that point that this was a dangerous technology uh, and years went by, I was still researching many things, and finally uh, I was asked by the publisher that I had done some work for if I could write the book, and I wrote the book. Now I'm on the first book tour, and um, what I want to do tonight is, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about, um, first, the conspiracy theory nonsense. Uh, we are constantly called conspiracy theory theorists. We're constantly called tin hats, uh, tin foil hats, and um, this is getting very thin because uh, almost every other article uses the term conspiracy theory, and it's getting a little old. So I'm wondering what they're going to come up with next. Um, <coughs> and I'll be talking and reading both uh, because I want to be exact uh, because you deserve that. Um, I'm a big fan of Professor Peter Dale Scott, who has written uh, about American history. He was a professor at UC uh, Berkeley. Uh, he's written about American policy and politics, and he calls it deep politics. And what that means is that our nation is not really being run by the Constitution and the policy that uh, our government officials are elected to uphold but it is being run by a military corporate enterprise, uh, what Eisenhower warned us about, the military industrial complex. And so we are subject to that now. And back in the 90s, uh, many of us probably didn't notice, I certainly did, uh, the military went through a uh, revolution. It's called the Revolution in Military Affairs, RMA. And uh, from that revolution in military affairs entered asymmetric warfare. We have had symmetric warfare, which we're all familiar with, where one enemy is on one side, the other enemy is on the other. There's bombs being dropped on various nations. And now we have an asymmetric warfare. And what this is, is it's come of age since the uh, invention of non-lethal weapons. And non-lethal weapons is a bit of a misnomer because you can actually die from these weapons. What they are, simply put, is they're electromagnetic weapons. And this is why I entitled the book Chemtrails, Harp, and the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet Earth. Full Spectrum Dominance is a military doctrine that the entire U.S. military is now dedicated to. And what it means by spectrum is the electromagnetic spectrum. And so full spectrum dominance means all the way from gamma rays and on is to be dominated as a weapon. What uh, asymmetric warfare eventually came to mean more recently is that now we are all, uh, we are all potential adversaries. And this is certainly true since 9-11. Uh, with, as you know, with the laws that were passed, <coughs> The definition of a terrorist now can be created ex post facto. And so our phones are tapped, they are being, um, they are being recorded by huge Cray computers. And all of this is not because the government suspects you or me particularly, but because it is simply policy to cover all the bases in asymmetric warfare, in case, in case something arises that could be called terrorist or dissident. And the difference between the word terrorist and dissident is getting vaguer and vaguer. Um, so this revolution in military affairs occurred in the 90s. What Peter Dale Scott said is that the conspiracy of power we face today 
is not self-contained and extrinsic to the basic socio-political structure of America. It is an integral cause and part of a larger war machine, an apparatus with a settled purpose fixed on achieving and maintaining global dominance. So though Professor Scott, of course, did not know it, it what he said is an excellent uh, summation of this chemtrails heart technology I'm going to talk about tonight. This technology is now steering us into a what was once called technotronic future, the very centerpiece of the globalist dream of power. In 1970, geostrategist Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote uh, in his book, Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. He wrote about exactly what we're experiencing now, what has begun. Kissinger tutored Republican presidents, Brzezinski tutored Democratic presidents, and in fact is still tutoring the present sitting president we have. The technocracy we are witnessing without knowing it, what, what we are looking for, what we are looking at has been underway for decades. Okay, so um, the first, next thing, besides the conspiracy theory, is I've been talking to all the audiences. I, I, I added it in because I, I note a great deal of fear in people. And I want to address a thing called cognitive dissonance. So um, cognitive dissonance uh, is the mental stress or discomfort we experience when we feel forced to hold two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values at the same time, uh, or when we are confronted by new information that conflicts with our existing beliefs, ideas, or values. An example might be, our military was created to protect us. Our military has gone rogue and is using us as experimental subjects. How can we hold both of those together? We simply can't. So if you wonder that so many people are not wanting to examine what I saw in your skies tonight when I drove in, you are in a tremendous chem fog. And those chemicals can only be seen as a sort of uh, darkened, cirrus cloud cover and um, you would have to collect and uh, collect specimens that are being dropped perhaps you see fibers that are coming down like uh, spider webs they look like spider webs but they're not do not touch them because they are chemically active but with gloves you can collect them and then if you can find someone who knows a good lab, many labs are lying, so you have to find an ethical lab and have it checked. You can collect your rainwater, have it checked. You can send your hair in, a swath of your hair, and have a heavy metals test from a lab that you, you trust. You don't have to accept this on faith. You can start testing on your own, and that's my hope is that you will draw together and begin to share information. Uh, and we'll talk about that at the end of the talk. But first let's talk about the fear that is everywhere abroad. To get to the root of fear, we must examine the veil of media deception we are laboring under. Uh, on May 30, 2000, U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman uh, General Henry uh, H. Shelton stated that one crucial component of the military doctrine of full-spectrum dominance includes the use of deception to, quote, defend decision-making processes by neutralizing an adversary's perception management and intelligence collection efforts. Now, the problem is, when he mentions, when he's talking about uh, adversaries, he's talking about us as well. He's not just talking about foreign nations. So um, this is what we're facing, is that we have been 
put into a category without our knowledge and we are being subjected to various experiments that the military is running uh, in order to plan future wars, space wars, many things, many agendas, and I'll, I'll discuss those agendas. So now, cognitive dissonance. Because human beings are driven to know what things mean, it is understandable that we strive for internal consistency. Thus, the experience of inconsistency or dissonance in the knowledge we're receiving from our media feels unpleasant, and our desire is to end it as soon as possible, either by turning away or by some simple action that will solve it once and for all. We are motivated to try to reduce the dissonance and reachieve consonance in any way possible. And if the dissonance threatens our survival or worldview or confidence in the future of our children, we may try to avoid situations and information that increase our feeling of dissonance. I can only imagine how many people knew about this event and thought, oh no, I'm not going to go, it's just going to be more bad news. Right? I mean, you probably said it before you came. You thought, well, okay, I'm a glutton for punishment, I'll go. <laughs> Yeah? I mean, I'm telling you, and then, oh, let me just read it here. Uh, it is not the facts that create our confusion, our depression, and our defeat, but it's the cognitive dissonance that psychology and sociology PhDs have been barraging us with via our media sources for over 50 years, tempting us to bury ourselves in a shallow, entitled personal life or in antidepressants. Yeah. When we look up at the sky and see what we have been told are contrails, we should learn to ask ourselves, are my perceptions being managed? This could be a liberating question if we but ask ourselves. Then there are public servants paid by us, and caught in a web of federal dictates, and not serving the public that their office was created to serve. As journalist David Tullis said in an interview with Bob Colby, director of the Chattanooga Hamilton County Air Pollution Control Bureau, our local officials now often are little more than a local face on the remote and global power sitting in Washington. However, the next day after that was written, on the West Coast in Shasta County, what happened? The Shasta County Board of Supervisors voted unanimously to investigate the geoengineering issue, all agreeing that the citizens who testified, 500 of them, had provided compelling and credible evidence. This was recent. That was very recent. That was in July. Wow. Right. So we are not hopeless here. In Ashland, Oregon, <laughs> I loved reading about it. I thought, wow, it's right on my tour. Okay. Family, the family farms measure was passed mm -hmm. to prohibit GMO crops from being grown in this county. You were successful because you cared, you united, you organized, and you did public outreach. This is all we need. And then, other success stories, I like to give you the good news first. <laughs> Thousands of employees of the New England grocery chain, Market Basket, recently united and walked off their jobs to protest the firing of a CEO who had always respected them enough to offer them a generous package of profit sharing and bonuses. Wow. Yeah. Dane Wigington, reports, as you know, he's, he's right down the road from you, 
reports at his website, geoengineeringwatch.com, that patriotic group groups like Save, the America, Save America Foundation are joining the movement to expose and end toxic geoengineering programs. In our struggle for the planet, we all must strive to come together, whether we are liberal or democrat, whether we like how someone looks or we don't like how they look. We must unite together in our purpose. Then another success, I like this one, in Vancouver, BC, 80 Chevron pumps in four Chevron stations on Native American land were shut down because of the Pacific Trails pipeline going through their land without permission. Since January 2004, the Michigan Penal Code Act 256 has criminalized terrorist harassment, including electronic and electromagnetic weapons, with prison sentences beginning at 15 years. This yeah. is so far the only state. Wow. How many of you know someone who's being targeted with electromagnetic weapons? This is real. I want everyone to know. I know many victims, so I'm sorry to say. In other words, there is good news all around, uh, and we can overcome, if we can only overcome the assault of cognitive dissonance by observing how it works, if it's working on us, and awakening from the bad dream with energy aplenty for a life that includes public participation. What can happen if we are able to awaken our consciousness from our chains of cognitive dissonance put upon us by corporate media and all the PhDs that work for them is as yet unimaginable. I hear hopelessness all the time about this. I'm not at all convinced this is hopeless. But it is not going to be perhaps a simple direct action, boom, it's over. It's going to entail our evolution as communities that we are awakening to something we're not being told by big media. All right, during my presentation, please observe yourself. Have you fallen prey to a subtle habit of cognitive dissonance? Okay, now we begin talking about the technology. Chemtrails and HARP work in tandem for the military intelligence industrial complex. Okay, contrail. I look up. What I'm looking for, if I can see at from 28,000 to 35,000 feet, that's one thing. I'm looking to see if there's a wingspan behind the aircraft before the exhaust that is heading out into the sky. That one wingspan is the U.S. Air Force distance standard for contrails. Now, if you look up instead and you see the exhaust coming out of the back and there is no span between the exhaust and the pipe that's coming out, then you're talking chemtrails, possibly, all right? Uh, the second thing, if the chemtrail, if the contrail lasts longer than 30 seconds, Either chemicals have been added to the jet fuel, usually JP4, or you're looking at a chemtrail that is unloading a chemicalized brew, usually with barium, aluminum, strontium, mylar po uh, polys, and possibly biologicals piggybacking on the mylar. This is the typical brew that is being unleashed upon us. Now, does that mean every place is getting the same brew? No. I have been told by a CIA mentor of mine that there are 12 basic brews, and they are adjusted according to the purpose of the experiment being run over that geographic area. And when I say geographic area, we're not just talking America here. You see, you've seen some of these. Australia is being, all the NATO countries are being hit. All of them. In fact, it seems to be, I noticed with Croatia, the day Croatia joined NATO, 
The next day, its skies were loaded with chemtrails. So it seems to be part of joining. It's like what happened to Ukraine that I was going to say later, after this thing that happened in Ukraine. Now the IMF is going to uh, loan them how many billions of dollars? As long, is it 32? 17. 17. 17 billion dollars, as long as they let GMOs into their country oh. and begin to grow. Them. And so now they're so poverty stricken in the Ukraine after all this brouhaha that's happened that their beautiful black earth, some of the best earth on the planet for growing, will be sold for a song because the people are starving and need the money. So this is how politics today are being run. Food and water. Food and water. And so we're going to get to California very shortly, and that includes you, Southern Oregon. All right. Now let's talk a little about global warming. What is it and what isn't it? We're told that global warming is due to carbons. It's due to what's coming out of our exhaust. Well, I certainly agree that what's coming out of our exhaust and the various pollutants in our air are exacerbating the problem. But they are not the cause. The cause is ionospheric heaters, like HARP up in Alaska. There are many of these. It has been the dream of militaries since World War I to control the weather. In fact, there's a document that you can find on the web. I was surprised by how many open source military documents there are. I didn't have to do any FOIAs. They're all on the net. Owning the weather by 2025. Read it. And 2025 is being liberal. It's a done deal now. The weather is being owned. However, it is experimental. They're still running experiments to see uh, all the way from how much aluminum they need in order to reflect, uh, to be conductive to the communications they have in mind, what the aluminum is doing to the soil and trees, um, <clears throat> who can then buy up land for a song uh, when the aluminum has driven a farmer or a gardener off their property. These are all, uh, this is just the beginning. This is, it's just an amazing money maker. You know how they say in America everything's a money maker. Well, so is disaster capitalism. And when you can control the weather with this, what I call the chemtrails harp dump and pump, well, the sky's the limit for money, and I'll talk about that. Okay, so for global warming, I want to stop there a moment. Let's look at that. In the chapter two, I go in and I deconstruct Bernard Eastland's patent for HARP. It's one of many patents. There are about two dozen patents for HARP. It's such a fabulous uh, technology for getting energy out of the ionosphere. And how it works is, and I really do need a slide for it, but I don't have it on this bunch, so I'm, I apologize. But follow me closely. All around us, we can't see them, but there are magnetic lines of force. And they're all going up, 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 up to the ionosphere, through the magnetosphere, up to the ionosphere. And if you heat that, if you send heat, and you focus it like the micro, like the uh, the array in um, in Gakona, Alaska. You, s you torque them all up, turn them on, and you send it up. It focuses on maybe uh, 13 kilometers up in the ionosphere. It then will bubble it out because of the heat, and this vacuum that is now created will suck up some of our atmosphere along with some of our jet stream up there. Now that what that heat is doing is it's it's uh, popping electrons off of the atoms up there, just popping them off and then activating them, and now it all begins to come down as the heat is lowered below. Down they corkscrew on those magnetic lines of force, each one of them doubling, tripling, quadrupling in energy. Once it gets into the lower atmosphere, our troposphere, then the harp and other instruments 
that are ionospheric will begin to uh, steer them into various agendas. What this does to our atmosphere, and as you notice, chemtrails are laid every day. Maybe you didn't get them every day. A lot of places say, well, hey, we didn't get any, you know, and they're like hoping they won't get any more. <laughs> but the truth is that, uh, you know, they're being laid somewhere else. It's not like, you know, we should feel relief. I mean, it's okay to feel relief, but we're all in this together on planet Earth. So they've got to lay them every day because those metals that are conductive and that, uh, that can be used for several, seven agendas that I'm going to talk about, they, uh, they drop and they have to be laid again and again and again. Very expensive, as you can well imagine. So you must know that your tax dollars are not the only thing paying for this. Okay? There's no way. No way it could just be tax dollars. Um, so the global warming that you're experiencing is the ionospheric heating. And that heating has a name. It's not ohmic heating. It is cyclotron resonance heating. And there's a reason I want you to know about this, because it has to do with our health. Okay. All right, so here is, uh, let me just tell you what Eastland calls it. So what I just explained to you, here's some uh, more complex words. Pass a certain radio frequency current through a concentric coil with the axial magnetic field confining the plasma, plasma being fourth state of matter, it's like an electrified matter, uh, confining the plasma, and in each half cycle of rotation up those magnetic lines of force, down those magnetic lines of force, about the magnetic field lines, the charged particles acquire energy from the oscillating electric field lines the charge uh, uh, from the oscillating electric field associated with the frequency. Okay, good enough. That's, that's what's going on all the time. Sometimes you can see when it's been going on, if a weather front is being created, or not really created, but moved or influenced in some way, because you'll see, uh, and I think I show, this is not one, but where you see little lines that all go, like, a, like if you threw a pebble into the, in the lake, you'd see the ripples come out. That's frequency. There it is. That's frequency. So uh, some instrument, ionospheric instrument, is, is cyclotron resonancing, heating that bit of uh, chemtrails, okay? All right, so now let's turn to what Robert O. Becker says about cyclotron resonance. Unfortunately, it has to do with us. He wrote two great books. I highly recommend both. He's a physician and a researcher, great, great guy. Uh, the Body Electric, terrific book, and Cross Currents, The Perils of Electropollution, The Promise of Electromedicine. So here's what he says, just a short paragraph. Cyclotron resonance is a mechanism of action that enables very low strength electromagnetic fields acting in concert with the Earth's geomagnetic field to produce major biological effects by concentrating the energy in the applied field upon specific particles, such as the biologically important ions of sodium, calcium, potassium, and lithium. Now, at the same time Becker wrote this, Clifford Carnicom was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he was collecting a lot of data on a shoestring budget. He was living in a trailer. He's, he's a good friend of mine. I met him uh, long after he had begun this research. And what he noticed was <clears throat> that he was measuring a pulse that he was hearing, and it was coming from the sky. He could even <coughs> determine the direction it was coming from, but he was convinced it, that though it may have used towers in that direction, it was coming from somewhere else, much more pervasive in the sky. So <clears throat> here's what he says. 
uh, Karnikam had ex has examined cyclotronic resonance as it relates to the relationship between an atmospheric ELF that's extremely low frequency harmonic he has detected and the potassium ion, which we need for our health and our immune system. <coughs> Mr. Clifford wrote, the fifth harmonic of the ELF that has been repeatedly measured over a period of several years corresponds to the cyclotronic resonant frequency of potassium. This fifth harmonic, along with numerous other harmonics, is a regular component of the ELF radiation that is under measurement at this time. So, uh, global warming is definitely about the cyclotronic resonance going on with the ionospheric heater technology. And that cyclotron resonance, because HARP is pulsing a certain pulse into the earth, into the lower atmosphere, that cyclotron resonance is affecting our elements that we need to be healthy. Now, I'm sorry to say that I believe, and I can't, I don't have a, a footnote, I don't know, maybe there is a footnote in here where I prove it, but I believe that it's the big pharma and the medical industry are in league with this technology to make money off of bad health. And um, this is what Naomi Klein called disaster capitalism in her terrific book, The Shock Doctrine, that she wrote several years ago. She was a Yale graduate. And disaster capitalism goes a long way toward looking at all the things that are involved in this technology. Um, before I go into that, and I will, I want to talk about weather derivatives. I want to talk about who owns the weather <coughs> service. Uh, let's, let's look at the seven agendas that I believe the military is uh, utilizing this technology for. Okay. I'll say I'm real brief. One, weather and environmental modification for the purpose of warfare. And that warfare is all the way from political warfare to economic warfare to electromagnetic pulses. Um, weather derivatives, that would be the economic warfare and the disaster capitalism. So here, just to let you know, those who don't know what weather derivatives are, they were created by Enron. You know, you remember Enron, don't you? Yeah. Uh, weather derivatives are temperature-based financial instruments anyone can buy on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or trade in over-the-counter markets. They are usually structured as swaps, futures, and call put options. The temperature standard of 65 Fahrenheit and 18 centigrade is set by the energy industry and follows atmospheric conditions reported by authorized organizations like Weather Risk Management Association uh, and uh, TFS Energy, etc. Well, okay, so uh, so somebody's making money off of uh, weather, and uh, perhaps it's just the act of God weather that I truthfully don't know if we have anymore. Um, no, actually, what happened is that several very giant corporations, and uh, you'll recognize them have purchased the weather uh, channels and uh, can give insider traders information so that they can make a pile of money off of the coming disasters that are planned. So working hand in glove with the earthquake warning system, which truthfully now I'm in doubt if it's really an earthquake warning system or maybe it's an earthquake creation system. Um, a huge signal in the ionosphere before the magnitude 7.8 earthquake in Sichuan <coughs> province, China, on May 12, seemed to be code for HARP operations. Um, so in 2011, E.L. Rothschild <coughs> LLC, the private investment company of Chairman Sir Evelyn de Rothschild, 
and CEO Lynn Forrester de Rothschild purchased a 70% interest in Weather Central, the world's leading provider of interactive weather graphics and data services for television, <coughs> web, and mobile. Um, Raytheon, once the owner of Hart Patents, reports the weather for the National Weather Service and for NOAA through its advanced weather information processing systems. And Lockheed Martin, another top 10 uh, military contractor, does forecasting uh, modeling for the FAA. More recently, biotech giant Monsanto acquired Climate Corporation for $1 billion. So um, when, when it looks like Wall Street is making money from weather, it appears that that weather is being created and some of the insiders are being given the inside track on making money from disasters. Think about uh, Hurricane Katrina um, at the mouth of the Mississippi, a, an international port, I might add. Think about Hurricane Sandy at the New York and New Jersey uh, international ports. Uh, these are actual uh, Harp created events. FEMA was in uh, New Orleans a week before the uh, tragedy, and uh, it was all planned. And the port now has been redone. And all those people, I don't know how many thousands of poor people, will never return to their homes because they're restructuring it. It's a, uh, it's a completely different place now. The same thing happened in New Jersey and the New York port. All the poor people that somehow can target just the poor area, not the rich area. We're talking a tremendous targeting, focusing capability okay. of small areas. Haiti. Haiti, another one, what, 100,000 people dead. So um, we're in, to me, we're in the realm of evil now. And uh, it is up to us to uh, understand our condition and that disaster capitalism is the last stronghold of the capitalistic system that is now uh, has been <coughs> terribly burdened by the our fractional reserve uh, profit-making uh, uh, crime syndicate that has uh, milked this country uh, as much as it can. So now it's turning to disasters. Then that way we can send in uh, soldiers, we can send in intelligence agents, we can blackmail countries that are up against the wall from, the, from having lost everything, uh, and we can send the IMF in with new conditions that they have to obey. So I think I've made my point on that. It's very it's, it's very depressing to me, actually. All right, second operation, electromagnetic operations. Uh, drawing charged particles down from the upper atmosphere into our lower atmosphere, spreading barium and aluminum particulates to increase the conductivity of our lower atmosphere. So those of you who've said, uh, and I've heard it everywhere I've gone, you know, the heat this summer was so hot I felt like I was being microwaved. Well, you were. Because you have breathed in the barium and the aluminum and the strontium. They are highly, highly conductive. And the heat coming down with the UVs and, and the chemicalizing synergy that is operant in our atmosphere now that we're breathing, it is as if it's heating you from the inside and the outside. That's what it means to be breathing conductive metals. Okay. Um, okay. Third operation, military operations. Uh, from refueling low orbiting platforms like XB-47B <laughs> to space operations like the space-based scalar space fence. I don't know if you've seen that in the uh, some of the NASA and NOAA and Air Force uh, sites. Maybe you don't go to those like I do. Uh, but we now have the next phase of the HARP ionospheric heater 
um, operations, and that is being called the space fence. And I'll I'll mention that a little later. That'll be what my next book is about. Um, okay, and this is all replacing the old ground-based missile defense system. That's all anachronistic now. Uh, fourth operation, biological chemical operations. Biotechnical delivery of biowarfare components via nanotech, and that includes control of human behavior through plugging our nervous system into a conductive environment. Uh, the fifth operation, planetary and geophysical operations. From Earth changes in the troposphere and magnetosphere to geographic renovation of nations. Uh, revise them, you know, destroy them, then revise them. Uh, big oil is in on this, fracking is part of it. The tomographic capability of HARP is a big part of it. In other words, the tomography of HARP can go down hundreds of miles in the Earth and find um, underground bases, um, uh, catches of gold and, uh, I don't know, jewelry or something. Uh, and uh, it uh, is, uh, is activating the plates, right? It's activating the plates under the Earth. And so along with the fracking, fracking is part of it. And then earthquakes are triggered, sinkholes are collapsing, salt domes are collapsing, uh, and, you know, I don't know how much longer we're going to see New Orleans being the way it looks now in the bayou. Uh, especially that during the BP uh, Gulf catastrophe, they, they uh, inserted a lot of the chemical core exit into the Gulf, which apparently is eating through uh, the entire coastline and oh. uh, the fish and everything. Okay, that's it. Then the sixth uh, we all know now, since, thanks to Edward Snowden, though I knew what Edward Snowden knew ten years before he said it. Intelligence and surveillance for the sake of what the military likes to call C4, command, control, uh, communication, and computers. And that would include virtual warfare, possibly. We'll look up in the sky one day and we'll see a holograph of uh, a whole fleet of UFOs uh, landing uh, in the United States. Perhaps we'll see... Jesus and Mary up there, I don't know. Uh, but the uh, virtual reality is uh, definitely one of the, um, the abilities of the HARP technology. <coughs> and of course, mind control. And again, the next book will be about how they're going to plug our nervous systems in. And the final seventh operation that I also will talk about next, uh, and I don't talk about in this book at all, but it is an interesting one, and some of you, I, I'm sure, are interested in it. And that's the detection of exotic propulsion systems. That um, by creating this ionized atmosphere, this plasma atmosphere, we could actually see exotic propulsion systems that are either cloaked, and that would be with uh, just our technology, or even possibly exotic uh, vessels that are from other dimensions. I uh, told uh, the audience in Mount Shasta that the military had had discovered 13 parallel dimensions, and but hoped to a 30 some, and uh, it sounded preposterous to a person. But the uh, quantum physics now is very much dedicated to this, and most of us know about a science. Uh, they're 50, at least 50 years ahead of us in what we know about what they've discovered. So, okay, those are the, um, the seven. And uh, I wanted to just say a word, I forgot to do this, about the cirrus cloud cover that we're experiencing. You know, the idea is that it's, it's deflecting solar rays and lowering our global warming. Oh, it's an outright lie. Um, here's what uh, the cloud physicist William R. Cotton says. Cirrus clouds contribute to warming of the atmosphere owing to their contribution to downward transfer of long wave radiation. In other words, they are a greenhouse agent. It has even been proposed <coughs> to send in clear air in the upper troposphere to produce artificial cirrus, which is what they're doing, of course. It's not just proposed, they're actually doing it. 
which would warm the surface enough to reduce cold season heating demands. Oh, they just want to save our electric bill. Sure. Uh, so the prospects for seeding cirrus to contribute to global surface cooling do not seem to be very good. Well, of course not. It's, a, it's, a, it's an outright lie. But as uh, Goebbels, the famous Nazi propagandist, said, if you repeat a lie often enough, the people will believe it. Um, okay. Next, let's talk about water. Um, okay. First food, food scarcity. Uh, it's possible that we're going to see in our lifetime a food digital dollar. In other words, hunger will then be the commodity. Um, well, they're already making a lot of money off of poverty, and so next, uh, food and hunger will be manipulated. And that's Monsanto, of course, and, uh, and various agribiz <coughs> corporations. Um, international dom and domestic control over water and food is a long-term objective of the powers that be. And here it's through, I don't know, is it here? Who do you have? The, California has utilities like PG&E. Do you have PG&E here? Sure. No, we do. Okay. All right. Um, behind the crisis fomented in Ukraine lurks a move to dominate food. And I told you about that, so I don't need to repeat that. Uh, the, some of the corporations that are involved in this, besides Monsanto, that would be DuPont, Syn Syngenta, Bayer, Dow, John Deere, Eli Lilly, Cargill, etc. They have all diversified. Um, even Lockheed Martin is in on the food uh, business. So um, the uh, U.S.-Ukraine Business Council's 160-member executive committee is packed with U.S. agribiz corporations whose number one lobbyist is, oh, who else? The U.S. State Department. And whose public relations are handled by Hill and Knowlton, the same CIA spin doctor that conjured up the false story of incubator baby atrocities to get the American public to back the first Gulf War under former CIA director and then President George H.W. Bush. Water is a human right is under assault. Uh, as Gies, I, massacring his name, Grafland of the Max Planck uh, Foundation put it in 2011. Artificial electro-based cloud formation, ELF science, will deliver a technology for stealing other nations rain and thus increase regional tensions. Less rain or due consequences of low sunspot numbers will be hijacked by the politicized CO2 consensus, propagandizing science. He has that in quotes. Water deficient nations will increase and the importance of mutual interest water diplomacy will rise. Politics, beliefs, and budgets are the three main eroders of science. The CO2 narrowly focused scientists don't understand even the most fundamental geophysical facts like the continuous shifting of both poles due to our wobbling globe or the northern southern hemisphere climate mirroring. Um, a few weeks ago in Toledo, Ohio, tap water for 400,000 people was found to be toxic. Residents were warned not to boil the water as heat only intensified the toxicity. The press release read, these organisms in the water are capable of producing a number of toxins that may pose a risk to human and animal health. Uh, the cause? Well, they don't know. Um, oh, I might, though. Uh, the fact that heat intensified the toxicity smacks of the chemtrails heart pump and dump. Will the city now have to buy Nestle bottled water? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what they did. 
Uh, the Nestle water grab is happening from California to Maine. Michigan Citizens for Water Conservation fought for eight years to limit Nestle's access to Macosta County water and have succeeded in limiting Nestle, but were left with a hefty legal fee. In 2012, Oregon's Keep Nestle Out of the Gorge Coalition took up the fight to prevent Nestle from building a water bottling facility in the Columbia River Gorge City of Cascade Locks. 30,000 Oregonians protested the proposal and asked the governor to put a stop to the water exchange process that would allow Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to give away Oregon's water. The coalition is composed of consumer advocacy, labor, relig religious, environmental, and public health groups. How many of you have heard of that coalition? Isn't the media just wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> then there is bankrupt Detroit, whose population has sunk to 700,000 and whose unemployment is 35%, more than, uh, with more than 100,000 foreclosures. Detroit Water and Sewage Department, which serves 4 million, more than 40% of Michigan's population, has cut off service to 120,000 Detroit citizens who can't afford to pay their water bills. Mm -hmm. Detroit's geography makes it, makes it very interesting because again, what do we have? We have another international border city. Um, it's not just an international border city, but it is also on the Great Lakes that represent 95% of the surface fresh water in North America. Large, yes. After being abused by industrialization for more than a century, the Great Lakes watershed is now being subjected to climate change, hydraulic fracturing, and oil pipelines. Okay, so there's another idea of how to get the water, how, to, how the control of water. We like to think of water as a human right. That is not how it's being looked at internationally now by the powers that be. Both water and food are intimately involved with weather and weather engineering. Okay, now, California coast. In the first week of August of this year, hundreds of thousands of dead anchovies washed up near Santa Cruz, the third die-off in three weeks. On July 18, thousands of white croakers washed up on Manresa State Beach, on July 25, the first anchovy casualties at Capitola near Esplanade Park. California is being pushed to the wall by drought and forest fires. Why? To force legislation that will give government and big agribusiness control over groundwater rights while filling the disaster capitalism pockets of industries, including lumber. The first statewide mandate for California groundwater legislation has already arrived, thanks in large part to the three-year drought that has been intentionally created by Chemtrails Heart pump, Dump and Pump technology. So here's how it works, in case you wondered how you run, the, how you run water away from California. Far enough out in the Pacific so no one can see what's going on, the U.S. Navy is performing weather manipulation experiments on weather fronts moving in toward the coast. We're not talking about seeding clouds with silver nitrate. This is electromagnetic weather manipulation, and it requires the presence of chemtrails filled with light conductive metals laid at 28,000 feet. The US Navy is creating and dispersing hurricanes as well, typhoons, like those that were out in, in Hawaii a few weeks ago. They're created, then they're dispersed by zapping chemtrails with lasers and next rad radio frequencies. High over our heads, military and commercial jets lay the nano-sized light metal chaff that remains suspended while the heavier metals drop slowly. By firing radio frequency into this chemically enhanced, statically charged curtain of chaff, a dense wall can be created. That dense wall is plasma. Radar and ra radio and radar, masers and lasers align onshore, offshore, on ships, 
on aircraft now lay a conductive waveguide for funneling the moisture coming off the South Pacific and steering it north beyond California so it can be folded into the jet stream over Vancouver Island, which will then dip and head east, taking California's moisture with it to the Midwest or the southern states or, as occurred just uh, last week or the week before, dump a flood just outside Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, that's how it works off the coast. All right. Uh, I was reading they also can run, run dry air down on those uh, air masses, uh, water laden air masses that dry them up. That's right, to create a drought yeah. over an actual area. Yeah, That's you can what actually see them coming out of the coast and, and then they'll photoshop that right out of the out of the picture. So you think, well, it just disappeared. Right? Act of God. But then there it is again the next day. So they can do it. They can do it. Very good. And of course, that's of course what they've done to Iran over and over again. They've taken Iran's water. And remember that flood two years ago in the UK? I mean, Britain was swimming in water. It was over the, over the roofs of cars. So, all right. So that's now I'm going to quickly go ahead because I wanted to be done in an hour. And it's just about an hour. Now let's talk about Morgellons. Uh, you know, end on a happy note. Um, <laughs> Morgellons, uh, for those who don't know, is a term from the 18th century uh, for a skin ailment. And I don't know how it ended up here in this century. It's just like the term chemtrails. I know where the term chemtrails came from. It came from the U.S. Air Force Academy chemical uh, chemistry manual of 1990. So I'm assuming that the military gave us this wonderful conspiracy theory term. And I, I'm guessing that they also gave us the Morgellons term. Um, people develop lesions. Uh, uh, well, let me give you the history first. All right, I'm living in Santa Fe. I become friends with Clifford Carnicum. And he happens to be uh, the number one person in the United States, perhaps the world, who is uh, doing mass research on Morgellons. He has already, by the time I met him, he's already determined that they are being delivered by the chemtrails. And he's a very meticulous, conservative scientist who repeats things ad nauseum until he's convinced it's really true. So he had already done that. He was collecting specimens. He had a thing called the red wine test. And I did it. I sloshed red wine in my mouth. After I cleaned my mouth really well, brushed my teeth, flossed, Rinse, rinse, rinse. I put the red wine in my mouth and I sloshed it around for five minutes, spit it into a, a, a nice sterile glass jar, and then waited for everything to settle. And uh, then he analyzed it, and it's true that I have the, the fibers. They're in me. I have those fibers, the so-called Morgellons fibers. Um, next, he wanted a blood test, so we all gave him blood. And he uh, put them on slides. I saw my blood under a microscope. I could see uh, he had a, a 3,000 power microscope. And uh, I could see the creature that he was pursuing, known as Morgellons, uh, eating my erythrocytes, my red blood cells. It had its head stuck into an erythrocyte and was wiggling around. And uh, my, it was making my round erythrocyte uh, become warped uh, at the point where it was sucking out the iron from, uh, from it. So um, <clears throat> he wants everyone to know this is not a skin pathogen. This is a blood-borne pathogen. It has been programmed. It is genetically engineered to be half wire, nano wire, and half organic. It uh, is uh, piggybacks on the polymers that are riding down in the chemtrails. Sometimes you see them as those fibers that look like, uh, look like uh, spider webs. It can be uh, many, many shapes, uh, but mainly they're wiry. And um, we breathe them in, 
they go into our lungs, and then they uh, they go into our blood system. Because they're nanoscale, they can go beyond the blood-brain barrier. They, they wiggle through. So um, they are uh, in our bodies, all right? Why don't I have the lesions? Well, I have a few theories, and uh, I'm certainly welcoming many more because we're on the threshold of a new era in which there will be uh, many cloned uh, beings, there will be hybrids, there will be uh, genetically engineered creatures, and uh, we are definitely on the precipice of a new era. So uh, in my case, uh, I'll remember when I just finished, okay? Uh, I, I, uh, I see them as a parasite, but I had a parasite when I was, uh, I think I was 21, I gave up meat and uh, didn't know how to cook fish right. So I ended up with this tapeworm that was this long. And uh, I ran to my, literally ran to my chiropractor with a little jar with this guy in it. And uh, he said, yeah, that's a tapeworm. So here, we're gonna eat this papaya, pineapple, and pumpkin seeds for five days. So I did, and uh, I guess I passed it because I passed the stool specimen, et cetera. But, I was in shock because it was the first time I realized that I'm living in a mammalian body. All right, so we, we're familiar with parasites. Second of all, we have flora and fauna in our intestinal tract. And if you've ever had dysentery, you know how long it takes to get that culture back. And it's a very helpful culture. It helps us assimilate, it helps us excrete. So they're our friends. So they're a symbiotic. And then, I had a Hoover uh, salesman come to my house once who uh, sadly showed me that my bed was full of millions of dust mites and that I was crawling into bed every night with these little friends. <laughs> uh, so it doesn't matter if you wash the sheets or anything, it doesn't matter. So we're not, this is not foreign to us. What is foreign, perhaps, is that this is genetically engineered. And uh, it has been programmed to eat the iron out of blood. And what does that mean? That means that that may explain why I've read that we're doing with 16% less oxygen than we were 10 years ago. That, that hemoglobin is an oxygen carrier. And if it's being, if it's being um, deconstructed in some way, then yes, we have a problem. What will solve that problem? Well, there are several things. Clifford Carnicum, I just visited him in Idaho uh, this summer. He has like, I don't know, 50 Petri dishes and aquariums going. He's trying various solutions with this little being that he has named the cross-domain bacteria. He has named it that because it literally crosses all three domains of life. There used to be six domains, maybe when you took biology, but now, since 1977, there are only three. And this little critter has been programmed to have characteristics of all three. It cannot be killed. However, it loves the acidity. More yeah, the more gallons. It loves acidity, and it hates alkalinity. And that's good news, because alkalinity can be produced and we can watch the balance, our alkaline acid balance in our diets. Um, my blood cells looked a little better than the others in the 200 people sample. And we tried to figure out why, because I'm older than the others. And it apparently is because I've been on a macrobiotic diet for 45 years and have not needed doctors or anything I self heal. And macrobiotics is very much about acid alkaline balance. And every day, I'm constantly going yin yang, yin yang. Those are the terms for acid and alkaline in, in the East. So, not sure, but it looked like uh, that was the that was the lead that got us to really start looking at alkalinity. Which one's the acid one? What are yin. What? Yin is acid. Mm -hmm. Yin is acid. Uh, yang is alkaline. And again. It, the idea of just eating a lot of alkaline, that's not a good idea because alkaline can become, extreme alkaline becomes extreme acid. So you need a balance and it needs to be looked at. 
Um, saliva balance. Huh? Saliva balance. Saliva is a really good way, but you can take the saliva and, you know, I used to do this, but, uh, you know, if you can make it, make a strand, it's usually running out for you. Uh, and then uh, vaginal and pee and all those different things. Sorry. So it's not hopeless. I, you know, I'm standing here. Uh, I know I have them, and I think everyone has them because they're moving in a nanoscale throughout the atmosphere. They're uh, floating through the earth, and uh, they are experimental. Um, the maybe most uh, concerning element of it is that they have microprocessors in them tiny nanoscale microprocessors, which are little computers. So this helps them to communicate. They are definitely a hive mind. They operate as one. And uh, it also means that they can possibly be communicated with by some guy sitting in Denver with a laptop. I don't know. Uh, and again, as uh, why I don't have them. I already mentioned the immune system. The second one is that someone who does have an outbreak, maybe their body is attempting to defend them better than my body is attempting to defend me. That's very possible. And then the third is that they can be remotely triggered in people to, uh, for outbreaks of uh, lesions. Have they identified any sort of, of uh, uh, correlations between those that do have the outbreaks and, and in their genetic history or their pH levels, that sort of thing? No, it's a great idea. The problem is when Clifford has sent his research in to the EPA and the CDC looking for a replication of his research, of his experiments, they ignore him. A year and a half later, they'll write back and say, well, we don't do that. And they'll send his specimen back after they've already examined it and done everything. I think the first few years that he was doing this work, he was getting a hundred and about a hundred and sixty or something. I've got it in the book. About a hundred and sixty hits from all the alphabet soup agencies in the government. They were very interested in what he was doing as he was attempting to retro engineer what, no doubt, they already knew. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, if I could go on to my conclusion now that I'm 15 minutes over time, and then we'll have um, have some questions and answers, and uh, I'll do my best. So what can we do? We who live in the America once considered the beacon of freedom and human rights. We who are now surrounded and suffused by a radio frequency at least 200 million times what we were accustomed to for millennia. Our transceiver bodies and brains are being pulsed by wireless devices, mobile phones, laptops, tablets, power lines, televisions, towers, and now heart frequencies. Frequency following responses, uh, flicker rates, we are subject to it all now, and they are profoundly influencing our minds without our consent. Now, there are some positive uses, Nick Begich uh, names. Uh, this technology actually could be used to remove pollutants and break down nuclear waste. There's no doubt in my mind that that's true. That would be a great thing. Still, I have the question, do we need to breathe the ionized atmosphere in order to do that? And what would the trade-off be? I think the trade-off looks bad for us. Uh, they could modify destructive weather. They could make tornadoes. Uh, not so destructive. They could make uh, hurricanes go away, like the Navy is doing in the Pacific. Um, they could make enhancements like biofeedback and the hemisync effect that uh, correct the imbalance between the right and left brain. I mean, there are things that could be done, but again, I'm left with this huge question of what is it doing to us to breathe this plasma air, this ionized air? And um, are they hoping, I mean, one of my theories is they're hoping that the next generation, maybe not our generation, or maybe some of you who are younger, that who can evolve to handle this? Can you evolve to handle it? Can you evolve to handle radiation, like they were doing the human radiation experiments 50 years ago, injecting children, I have a friend who was one of them, injecting children with radiation. So these. These are all questions they have as we head toward a transhumanist singularity future. 
And that, again, is going to be in the next book, and looking at that. Uh, meanwhile, further north and south in the Arctic and Antarctic, Operation Deep Freeze is underway. An electromagnetically driven chaff space fence, F-E-N-C-E, -E, is being built around our planet. The culmination of the long ago Star Wars Strategic Defense Initiative shield to purportedly block incoming missiles, debris, and electromagnetic shots over the bow while encapsulating our planet in an ionized bubble cut off from cosmic influences. We will truly become the silent planet as C.S. Lewis viewed it in his 1938 science fiction novel. Last sentence. We are now less than 18 months away from the absolute deadline to achieve a new global climate agreement at the 21st Conference of the Parties on Climate Change, scheduled to be held in Paris in 2015. It was regarding this important event that in May 2014, French Foreign Minister Laurent uh, Fabius said to Secretary of State John Kerry, we have 500 days to avoid climate chaos. I just can't figure out what he meant in that warning of climate chaos. And when, when did he say that? May 2014. I have the article. I read it, and I read it, and I read it. Until fall of 2015. Well, he's talking about before that conference comes up. But um, but he said it almost, did anybody see that YouTube of him? Anyway, he said it in a way that looked like he was trying to send us some sort of warning. And I'm still kind of haunted by it, so I thought I'd, thought I'd voice it on you. Yeah. All right, that's all I have to say. We'll have questions and answers, and then some of the local activists would like to uh, talk to you about what can be done. And uh, please sign the email uh, list out there. I'll be signing it. I'll, I'll happily be sending you information as I get it if you want me to do that. Okay? Thank you very much. Yeah, we've got the book back there. So, anybody questions? Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. Over there first. Yeah. Um, the Doppler radar stations. We had one put up on Mount Ashland. Any, um, comments on what? A any comments on the radar stations and the interactive grid? Well, I don't. Is that when I was coming into Ashland, I saw a series of towers uh, on hills. Uh, what will this Doppler radar installation do? Are they saying? Well, it's a giant globe up there, and if you're lucky sensitive in any way, it's impossible to get close to it. Yeah, and thanks to the 1996 Telecommunications Act, uh, we can't stop them from putting these towers wherever they choose. Is that the way it is in Oregon as well? I, I, I assume the federal law held everywhere. Well, I'm sorry. I, I have nothing to say. Okay. But I'm glad to know about it being there because I've been wondering about the towers around your town. So is this it's a tower. It's like a, it's like a globe. It's, it's like, like a, a round. The one like a golf ball. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That's the SPX. They can call it anything they want, but that is a heart installation. Yes. Yeah. I've watched the clouds change right. like <coughs> three different well, shapes in a couple. And we need minutes. to raise our hands. Right. Okay. Oh. Yes, sir. No problem. Have you ever figured out where they load these airplanes with this material? Uh, in the book, I list uh, maybe a dozen and a half uh, bases that I'm relatively sure of. And believe me, they're popping it around. Uh, they move them because they really, really don't want the public to know. And um, yeah, I have a chapter that includes the trucks that are hauling the chemicals and what they look like. And Yes? Who's, uh, who's got big investments in aluminum? Oh, that's a good tip. I, I don't know. I didn't check that, but that would definitely. The mines are all open, from what I understand. They're running. They're all running. Oh, I'm sure they're making a mint. Um, and you know about Monsanto's aluminum resistance seed, right? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah they're an insider. Hey, yeah. So if you're talking about the uh, uh, financial strategy 
for capitalizing off of disaster, um, uh, you know, basically um, uh, forcing farmers and, and uh, whatnot off of their lands. They have to have some sort of strategy for reversing that so that they can then uh, bring the land back to a more productive state afterwards, well, right? Well, the, I mean, the aluminum resistant seed is, is the way they're going. I mean, I agree with you. Uh, but, you know, uh, Eric Fromm, the psychologist, once said that there are two kinds of people. There are the death lovers and the life lovers. And I guess I'm assuming these are the death lovers. Yeah. 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 Other than continue to self-educate, which is hugely important, um, and educate others and raise awareness, what do you recommend local communities do? Well, uh, I'm a big believer in community. I mean, I'm from a community um, that seems to be complacent, uh, self-satisfied in their conveniences, and here I live in that town, and nobody really cares what I've done. So, I, you know, a prophet is unknown in their own home, I guess it's one of those things. Uh, uh, if you can, I, I mean, I don't know, knowledge is power to me. Uh, scientia es potencia. Knowledge is power. And I, I simply, what I said earlier is true, I simply don't know what we could do if we really understood what we're up against. And that's sort of my job, I'm a messenger. I'm bringing the news that to look at global warming, climate change, extreme weather, whatever you want to call it, we've got to pull ourselves away from corporate media because they're lying to us and they're leading, they're, it's a, this is a national security technology and we need to know about it so that we can make the right decisions as to <coughs> what we can do and the first thing I always say is educate. And it is interesting, uh, people, uh, I, I, again, remember uh, Carl Jung saying that when an American hears the word psychological, they always have the word just psychological. Well, I feel that way about knowledge. Yeah, Yolanda, knowledge is good, but what can we do? Well, well, I just said knowledge. I mean, you know, it, it's, read the book. Uh, I would love to see it read in a study group where people who, who don't read uh, can go and be with people and they can read a few paragraphs aloud and discuss it and maybe come up with some ideas of public outreach that could be done. I mean, people need to wake up. You know, don't you, that the last thing the powers that be want is a surge of action by a, a, a public, the public. They want us to stay asleep. They want us to stay in cognitive dissonance. And, and if we don't do that, they're, they're in trouble. So uh, I see knowledge as being a tremendous move, but it takes a big commitment. And I know you've already got commitments. You've already got spheres of influence that you're responsible for. I know that. You've got to decide priorities. To me, this is a big priority. I didn't know I'd be doing this, um, but I am. And, uh, and I'm committed to writing another book now. So. Uh, this cannot be allowed. I mean, if you know what was going to be in the next book, I mean, this is a very big plan that they have going. And truthfully, it won't work. But how much will we pay in the interim until it doesn't work? That's Why do you what say I don't that? know. Why do you say that it won't ultimately work? <laughs> no bid for empiric power on a global scale has ever worked. I say it as a historian. I've studied every culture in the world. <coughs> never Would works, even that? with technology, even with a technology like this. This is a very impressive technology. But some error will be made, some conscience will awaken. I know that. Meanwhile, we prepare on a local level because we don't know what's going to happen. What's going to happen. Yeah. Just a first comment. I think the biggest thing we can all do is contact your radio station as many times as you can. Get on the radio, whether it's Jefferson or KMED or, you know, try to write an article in the newspaper. Just voice your, thing, your thoughts. I mean, like I was up at Lake of the Woods and I saw a huge 
frequencies in the clouds, they created the high winds that spread the fire last Wednesday. So it was like, God, when you see that, report it so that we can get it out there, because the media is not going to talk about it, but you can get your voice, you know, on the radio or whatever, and say what you saw, and that, you know, there's terrorists, and they're in the government, you know, because obviously, they're the only people with these weapons. Then I had a question. <clears throat> when I see the hot frequencies, I notice that my energy goes down. And I'm sure I'm being microwaved. I notice when I'm in my house, I don't feel quite as tired. And I know the um, stucco houses can block 75% of the EMFs. I don't know. Do you know much about, like, just being in your home or oh, you yeah, the sun? That's that cyclotron resonance. Because yours is interacting with that outside. It, it, it creates a synergy that depletes your energy. We are, yes, we do have an electrical body, but we have, we are not entirely electrical. We have uh, other, you know, they used to call it ether back in the 19th century, and then suddenly at the birth of the 20th century, somebody somewhere decided that we weren't going to use that foolish term anymore. But we are not just electrical beings. So it, it does, it depletes our energy from that ether side of us. But I like I like the term ether. I, I've read Wilhelm Reich, I've read Bruce Cathy. I read all the guys that have been thrown out of the scientific community because they are actually life lovers, is how I see them. So um, yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah, and in your house it's, it's less, it's less, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just wondered if, as far as the actual um, chemtrails, the mechanics of the whole thing, spraying them, mixing up the chemicals, drying, you know, flying the airplanes, commercially or military-wise, has there ever been any whistleblowers that, that come out with this? There have been a couple. But uh, like this summer, I was contacted by a man in Canada who told me he had seven pilots ready to go public. And uh, they were, we were all going to meet at Clifford's in Idaho. And, um, and the day before, they all, they all pulled out. I think they're under uh, tremendous duress. And their families. I mean, this is a, a really serious uh, thing. So I, I just, I didn't say anything. You know? I understand. Yes? John Lear. Is the whistleblower. He's the son of the Lear Jets. And of course, if his YouTube uh, presentations are still out there on the web, they will have they will have a waiver saying if you watch this, you're guilty of death. As does the police state planning roadmap. If you read it all, at the end of it, it says you're in hot water. Okay, but what I want to say is there is a new documentary called Nuclear Savage, and that documentary does say that the Star Wars program is being launched and conducted from the Pacific Islands. So um, there is a location for that. And you know, we are all sons and daughters of light. And Jeffrey Smith was very bold when he was here on Wednesday, um, or Monday, whatever it was, a few days ago, after he came from the international and worldwide GMO conferences, which were held in Shanghai, China, and in Portland, Oregon. And he just out and said the term, the non-humans, so I think what we have to really realize is that back in the 1930s and in the 1940s, um, Churchill and our president at the time did some contracts with the aliens who came to Earth, and they exchanged alien technologies for human experimentation. And the GMO experimentation upon the entire global world populace has to do with depopulating the Earth. Here in America, the goal is one out of every two Americans have to go. And it's four billion people worldwide. 
So, you know, you have to use your human spirit to be stronger than this stuff because we do have a human spirit and we have the power to decree that this is a free will planet and to tell the non-humans to get the hell off our earth and then they have to go because they went to the eagle, they went to the leaders of the nations but they did not go to the people and we are the people and we outnumber them so we have to command them to leave. I mean, Mickey Okako and others, you know, these physicists simply plan on taking their space taxis and going to some other planet well, could you <laughs> after <laughs> they ruin our Earth. But we cannot let them ruin our Earth because our Earth is very unique. Thank you. Very good. Yes, I'm going to back up everything that she said. Okay. Is the, that? Yeah, because this may seem really far out and crazy, but this planet was populated by the reptilians before the human species came. And they have in their DNA or whatever they call it, their programming that they own this planet. No, I, I, I know this, so I know this and I've heard it. And I, I, I can't go there because I can't document it. But I, I hear what you're saying, but I need to let other people well, I have another question. I'll ask a question then. About for our own personal safety, do you recommend not going out at certain times of the day? Like not running at certain times of the day. Now, what about like not going out during the heat of the day, but going out like at night or in the morning and not going out when it's raining or anything about timing of why? It's all, all of the above is something that we, we definitely need to look at. I mean, I particularly think of children, children playing outside. It, it, it's a real question. And then uh, getting the lungs going uh, and breathing heavily is a, a real question. If you're sensitive to the heat, definitely think about going out. I mean, there's not the loosened spraying at night. So there's a different spray at night. There's a different spray at night. And in the early morning hours, yeah. Elevation is good. That I, I don't know. I haven't really looked at that, but it would be something that somebody could research. Yeah. I've come across some info um, that discusses uh, different alternative technologies, uh, like based uh, type technologies that can be disruptive to this sort of thing. Would your, your book uh, cover that at all? And to what extent has that been validated? Well, I, I actually had that in the book and my publisher took it out. It took two chapters out because it said that it was already overwhelming enough, the book. So those are the two chapters that I'm going to take forward to the next. And Reich is, is my man. Yeah. Cloud busters right. and right. Uh, and the whole thing on ether or or orgon yeah. orgon is ether. It's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, I think there's tremendous uh, tremendous possibilities in that. The only thing is you have to watch for it is uh, they're watching for it as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, that that I know because uh, I have a friend who uh, was an eco warrior for a long time. Right. And he used right. to uh, he used to gift. Yeah with Reich Tech, yep. the, uh, the cell towers. Right. And as soon as he'd pull up there and he'd be digging and he'd plant some of these things, these, uh, organ, generator. these organ generators, <laughs> then boom, here comes the white van pulling up and they've got their own little device to find them. And they okay. dig them up, throw them in the van and drive off. That's Wilhelm Reich. Oh, oh. Yeah, Wilhelm yeah. Reich. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it, I know there's a tremendous possibility there. Yeah. Yes. Are you telling me? Um, I'm just wondering about the website Biogeometry. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. Tell me about it. Well, he was here a little while ago, and I, I heard about the website down the grapevine, and I quite honestly haven't read the website, so I'm asking you what whether his device is. Who was here? Who, who? Um, uh -huh. I, d I don't know which of the, the doctors or PhD people were here. There was a presentation a few months ago so, here. Biogeometry. Yes. Yes. He's, he's a man named Ibrahim. There we go. I'm not sure the last name. So. Okay. There he is. And uh, yeah, I've heard good things but about it. But uh, it ameliorates this sort of well, they tech. Evidently, they put up some tower in Hamburg, Switzerland. 
uh, so many people got sick all at the same time plus the birds left. And people woke up and said, well, let's do something about that. So they invite these people in and they harmonized everything in the whole town. It's a small town. It's a hamlet. Yeah. It's a farming town. So it's a, you know, it's not like a whole city. Yeah. And now they have products on the web and I have no idea what So they, doing. okay, so he deals with frequency. Yeah. And he counters certain other frequencies with frequency. Yeah, yeah that, exactly. that sounds very plausible. Very wow. possible. That should be research. We can do that. Yeah. Um, okay, and then anybody, uh, I don't know, how's our time? Well, we're okay. 20 minutes. Yes. I do have a question. I, I see you over there. Okay, sorry. Of your, your safety in the disseminating this? Because yeah. I was told about this about 20 years ago from a man who literally moved all the time because uh, he said they were on his trail. And I thought he was a little kooky, but I also, he, he taught me some very valid energy work and stuff. And they've been all over the world. And so then I keep hearing, you know, oh, he wasn't so kooky. But, I, he was on the run all the time. I know and had no addresses or telephone number to get a reach Yeah, so I'm wondering. Yeah, I, I, I never, I never saw him within a few months again. I think that the climate back then was. It's like I told you about my story from 1996 mm -hmm. and the helicopter over my house. Uh, I think the climate now is is more benign uh, for people like me because I'm I'm on the fringe. Uh, I'm not being reviewed by the New York Times. Uh, there are scientists calling me night and day. Uh, and probably I'm being watched, would be my guess. Uh, but uh, they, it seems to be a done deal. And they really, uh, I think they have great confidence in, in themselves. And they're, not, they're certainly not expecting a groundswell from the public that has been cognitive dissonance. They certainly are not worried about that. I must admit that it didn't uh, seem strange to me that the fire and weed happened the very day I arrived. Mm. Oh, I, I must admit oh. that. But I can't believe I'm so important that they would kill uh, that they would raise 150 homes to the ground. Uh, but they might have chosen the time as a, a bit of a message. But I, they had other agendas there, and I, yes, I, I'm saying publicly, I do believe that it was started, uh, not and not by a transit, transient. Mm -hmm. no, no, this was an experiment. Yeah. Um, okay, and I got to get here. Sure. Yeah. Um, we had a handful of years where there was a lot of striping, like the barium striping, um, and and Doug uh, from the Maui Coalition spoke out about uh, the fogging. Um, kind of fogging coming off the coast. So we've had quite a bit of that. Um, I didn't know if you had any comments on, you mentioned different kinds of... Uh, well, this looked like fogging today yeah. when I drove in. And that's most of what we've had this I was year. We've all. had some of the striking, but you know, a, a different, clearly a different um, transport of the medium. Yeah, yeah. the man, yeah. man in uh, Maui, Bruce Douglas, he oh, Bruce, looks yeah. at the um, radar, satellite images and he sees these like bombs he calls them chem bombs chem bombs, bombs. yeah yeah and he feels they're ground based and, mm -hmm. and creates a big well there are some and they seem to be adding a little something different to the normal yes. brew uh the cia guy did i mention to you that he said there were 12 mixes yeah there were 12 mixes and so the chem bomb appears to be where they're just adding a little <coughs> something different at some sort of uh, uh longitude latitude but um, also, I, I have bad news. I have heard a rumor, actually, it's true, but that they will be soon able to deliver the chemtrails and you will see nothing. You will not even see them jet. But you will be able to tell that something's been there because your skies will still not be as wonderfully blue as they used to be. Yeah. Um, yes? Do you have an opinion of what could generate the so-called tipping point? Dean talks about to to cause enough people to rise up against. Well, I think that's why Dean is going everywhere and talking and talking and spending. I heard he's spending 16 hours a day, he and his wife, uh, on this issue. Uh, he and I both know that if you can you can quicken the public and just keep quickening, uh, it can. There is a tipping point. What was the percentage they say? Uh, 
10 percent of people or something. I don't know what it is. Uh, but I, I definitely feel a difference in the climate now. There's not nearly as much sneering. However, most people are so busy and so under the cognitive dissonance that I just feel that um, they, they don't want to get involved. They, they, their energy is, is being drained from them. And I don't uh, at all uh, despise these people or, uh, or anything. I, I totally understand, totally understand. But, you know, it only takes a few. You don't need a huge number of people, but you need a few very committed people. And that's, uh, I'm one, Dane's one. We have quite, quite a few in, in the uh, Chemtrails movement. I'm sure there are some in here, too. Uh, it's just a matter of your priorities. I didn't know this was so big when I started. I really didn't. I just thought of it as another issue. But I now see that this is the core issue to many of the issues that we're so concerned about. This is the one. This is the one. And, uh, and I now I'm going to, uh, you know, dedicate myself for a year to this next book. Yeah. Uh, there's a, another researcher. I believe her name is Sophia Smallstorm. Smallstorm. Yes, yeah, Sophia. Yeah, she speaks a lot about uh, chemtrails and its link to uh, transhumanism. Yes. Uh, which I believe is, is kind of the um, uh, idealized version of, of uh, our history of uh, what's that futurist name works at Google. Oh, uh, you mean the guy talking about singularity all the time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurzweil. Kurzweil. Right. Yeah. Great yeah. Kurzweil. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, he speaks to all of the, the positives that can come of this, of course. Supposedly. Right, supposedly. Um, and he has big backers. Oh, yes. Yeah, big absolutely. Big ones. Yeah. Um, but can you speak a, a little bit to uh, the, the link between that and transhumanism? I mean, between it seems like there's a very strong link, given what you discussed about the fibers being part organic. Oh, part. yeah. Uh, oh, this is totally connected to transhumanism. They're different colors, and so you can use frequencies to get the different colors. And basically, even Bernard Jensen, I'm an iridologist, mm -hmm. said, you know, you could probably look at the eye and even tell the thoughts of the person based on the fiber activity. I mean, it's like he thought later on through, through the telescopes or through yeah. microscopes to be able to look. You could probably even tell the thought pattern that would end up in a frequency in the body. Because so of the all, of these all frequencies bodies. of emotions have already been logged. They know all our emotions frequencies. They know all the disease frequencies. They don't even need to uh, to piggyback Ebola on on chemtrail on the polymers. They can just hit you with the frequency. Of well, I know there are techniques to um, uh, eradicate most if not all diseases by hitting them with the uh, uh, reverse frequency of, of that right. which they resonate. Right, but do you see now the connection to transhumanism? You see how it's going to work. Oh, We're yeah. all plugged yeah. into the nervous right. system. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere is ionized. Yeah. It's ready to go 24-7. Mm -hmm. They can hit a home. They can hit a neighborhood. They can hit an entire population of people with brown skin, black skin, white skin, whatever. Because all these have been, there's also racial frequencies that they already come to. So uh, it's, uh, it's easy to see how a, a, a prison planet of a hive mind could be uh, conceived. However, I want to say this. Consciousness really makes you, you they can't have the influence on you if you're highly conscious. Wow. And this is, this is, I, I have already noticed this. I've talked to other people about it. Consciousness is the key. And it's an awakeness. It's a taking responsibility, like, like I do. I take responsibility for my choice to do this. Uh, death is not something I really think about. Uh, I do not have fear, even though I have been targeted three times with electromagnetic weapons to get, to get my attention. That, that's all they were doing. They were getting my attention. So uh, consciousness is definitely a powerful, powerful uh, antidote to this technology. Think about it. It's all electric, right? It's electromagnetic. You have consciousness. It's a different, it's, it's along the same lines. 
but it's, uh, it's uh, I can't even you talk about it. You have to have an understanding see, of how to really, um, I don't want to use the word manipulate, but, but to, to, to work that, that frequency, that energy to your, to your benefit, correct? I mean, you can't merely be conscious of uh, the, the problem as, as a whole and just um, uh, hope that that's going to carry you forward. It, no. It's got to be mixed with... No, the consciousness a, itself a has a frequency. That's right. what I want to say. Okay. It has a frequency, right. which seems to be supersede the assaults. Because I have experienced the assaults three times, and I was able to go right through them, right through them. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, I want to comment on that, but what I was going to say was about the psychotropic drugs. Um, the raising of the consciousness, I've been studying that a lot recently, you know, to create some inspirational and transformational education, but um, it just changes the quality of how things affect you, and um, um, I think once we really understand it, we can articulate it, we put it in layman's terms so that it can be like everyday language, but we're still getting to the words of what we're discovering and experiencing. It's all new. I mean, yeah. we're in a new yeah. era. Um, I'm, I'm an ex-teacher, too, and I'm very concerned about the um, psychotropic drugs that are given to our kids in the schools and through the schools, not just, you know, the well, and those Yes, and those drugs have a frequency, and Big Pharma is deep into the transhumanist future, deep yeah. into it, and big money. money. And they're using the children uh, to, uh, I'm sure they're hitting them with frequency because all these drugs have that aspect to them. Well, I want to say this because it raises awareness. I was a teacher right here in this county, and at one of the high schools, they put in a doctor's office that, you know, clinics aren't clinics like they were before you get a phone call, even to get an, have an aspirin. They are administering psychotropic drugs right here in this county, on the campus, at school, and when I went in as a substitute teacher, uh, uh, because one of my students came up to me and said, Miss Ingle, I want to tell them I don't want to be on uh, Prozac. And I was kind of livid and I went into the doctor's office clinic, you know, turned doctor's office where they, you know, give these drugs right on campus here in this county. And I asked him, I said, do you get the parents' permission every time you uh, prescribe a drug or do you have them fill out one form at the beginning of the year? And they said one form at the beginning of the year. And I thought, uh huh. There goes the the uh, the parents' uh, consent and knowledge that this is happening. And then I've heard more things from high school students of immunizations being given under the age of 18 without parents' knowledge or consent. I want to scream and shout. I mean, I'm going to get on the circuit before you know it to tell parents what's going on. Absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm floored. I mean, and giving out the little orange fluoride pills right here in this county, in the classroom. Did, did you keep your substitute teacher job? <laughs> oh, I, I'm retired. I'm under the radar. I, okay. Yeah, because uh, substitutes can't really do much. Um, okay, a couple more, and then um, did, did the local activists want to get up here and say a few words to your people remaining? John, you want to come up? Um, let's go. Uh, you know, one more. I, I just wanted to say quickly, it's not a far leap for people who have begun to understand the genetically modified food to understand the genetically modified sky and electronic grid system. Very good. Very good. Exactly. It's all this, of the same. Go off. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, oh, uh, one more question. Are there any countries in the world that are not? Um, well, I don't know. Like I told you, I stuck with the NATO countries because I could, I could uh, affirm them. Any countries, any countries that are not being counted. Uh, so, oh, <laughs> South America. We run South America. Oh, so that's Getting droughts for years. Yeah. Every country we've gone to war has had a drought the year before we went in. There, there are some. I've done some traveling the last few years. There, there are some countries. I, I, I think it's just the NATO countries. I look into South America all the time, or Central America. Some some of the countries there are, and some are not. But but every country we've gone to the war have had a severe drought for the year before we went to war. So it's not just NATO. Syria, Iraq, 
Afghanistan severe drought before we went to war. And like I said, uh, I know Russia has this technology, so I'm assuming they're coming their country, but I don't know that because I couldn't find anything on it. And then China has a huge uh, ionosphere array. 50,000 people. And uh, they, are, uh, on the they are now making, as you know, an alliance with Russia, uh, trade through BRICS, uh, the, let's see, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and then South, South, South Africa. So uh, I assume I assume China's doing I have actually seen photographs of China being chemical, but I was assuming they were doing their own thing. I know they're all they're all experimenting. They're all experimenting. The big ones anyway. Okay, why don't you go ahead and okay. uh, just first of all thank you so much. Yeah, yeah.